thing is everyone in? All the book. <laughs> okay, is that any better? It's a little better, but it's, it's still mostly the same. Okay, so let's, let's, let's do this. I'm gonna switch from desktop to your laptop. Okay, how about this? Oh, that's great. Huh. Okay, so if that works, let me try to move back. <laughs> what kind of a bunny is that? It's a bunny. <laughs> Okay, is this okay or worse? A lot better. Yeah, yeah. Good. yeah. Okay, yeah, I don't really know what's going on, but all right, well, we'll try this now. Um, okay, let me come back to the screen here. Let's... Okay, let's maybe do a quick recap of where we were on um, Monday. So remember that this really was the lecture that we did the Friday before spring break. Uh, we're gonna start with the field, characteristic different from two or three. So you can think of F here as like the rational numbers. And let's take a look now, Y squared equals to a degree four polynomial, right? So the degree four polynomial in our case, we can write this way here. So this f of x is this x4 is to the 4, so on and so forth. Okay. So there were two things that we stated last time. So one is, if we just embed into P2, then we have a point at infinity, but this here is a singular point. You know, remember that we had kind of worked this out for a very specific quartic, but now we can say this for any degree for a polynomial. So we always have a singular point if we do the silly thing of embedding into P2. On the other hand, if we embed, <clears throat> excuse me, into P3, kind of using this weird substitution here, then here we have a collection <clears throat> of two polynomials where this F1 and F2 are now these quadratic polynomials. So quadratic over now four variables, X1, X2, X3, X4. And we found that this curve now has two points at infinity. So here what I'm calling um, O sub E plus or minus. All right, so we have these two points of infinity here. Now we also worked out a few examples of what happens here. So if we go back to our familiar quadratic or quartic curve, so this Y squared is equal to this one minus X squared, one minus K squared X squared, then this will have two points at infinity because the leading coefficient, A4, is a perfect square, right? So the whole point here is that if you're dealing with qu um, quadratic curves, degree four, if you wanna ask what are the points at infinity, you really have to take a look at the leading coefficient, right, so this coefficient, A4. Now we also looked at this example here, this Y squared is equal to one minus X to the fourth. This also has two points at infinity, because again, the leading coefficient is a perfect square, right? So A1 here is, is equal to one. However, if we look at this degree four polynomial, so this Y squared is equal to one minus X to the four, this is no points of infinity over the rational numbers because the leading coefficient A4 is negative one, that is not a perfect square. Of course, if we work over the complex numbers, then it is a perfect square, and then we have two points at infinity. Okay, but it's just pointing out that 
that if, in all of these cases, if you want to ask how many points at infinity do we have, we really have to be careful and look at the leading coefficient a4. Now, one thing I haven't said is about this whole question of whether the points are singular versus non-singular. So I'm going to try to recap to kind of say, what does that mean? What are we trying to do? So again, if we have a chordic curve, y squared is equal to f of x, we can think of this as a projective curve in two ways. So one, we can embed into P2. That's the naive way of doing it. The other one is that we can embed into P3. That's the slightly better way. And we realize that points at infinity are very different in these two cases, right? So we just said that if we look at the embedding in the P2, then this point at infinity, this O sub E, is a singular point. So really things don't work out very well. But in the second case, when we embed into P3, then we find these two points. Let's see if somebody's logged in here. Okay. Yeah, good morning. <clears throat> So in, in the second case, we then have these two points at infinity, right, correspond to, corresponding to whether or not the leading coefficient A4 is a perfect square or not. Mm, I have a question. Sure. And so in the, so if we embed it in P3, we have at most two points at infinity. Are they singular or not? Well, that's the question. Oh. Right, that's exactly the question I'm asking here. So oh, are right. the two points non-singular? Right, that's, that's the big motivating question here. So what I'm going to do is spend the day today giving a necessary and sufficient condition to determine whether we do have a non-singular curve. Right, that's the goal for today, kind of putting all of this together. So what do we mean by a non-singular quartic curve? So what we're going to do is set up some notation here so we can really discuss what does it mean to be non-singular. So the intuition is, remember that if we're dealing with an elliptic curve, we have the concept of the discriminant of the curve. All you have to do is just compute this number. If this number is non-zero, then we know that it's a non-singular curve. So we're gonna do the same thing with a degree four curve. So for the moment, let's take our degree four polynomial and let's factor it, All right? So here we'll have these roots E1, E2, E3, E4. They're gonna be complex numbers in general. So let's just take our polynomial. Let's just say that we can maybe factor it in this way. Once we do that, I wanna define this concept of what's called the discriminant. So the discriminant is kind of a weird idea, but there's two different ways you can compute this. One is you can just compute it just formally as a product. So here I'm looking at the products of these pairwise differences. So I have like E1 minus E2, E1 minus E3. So again, I'm taking the pairwise differences of the roots and you'll see that the discriminant is equal to zero only if I have repeated roots. So this is very similar to what happens for a quadratic polynomial. Right, the discriminant is this idea that is equal to zero precisely when our polynomial has repeated roots. Now, you don't have to use this really weird definition here. There's a slightly easier way to, to do this just by looking at the coefficients. So if someone were just to give you the coefficients a4, a3, a2, a1, a0, you can just compute the discriminant by looking at this really long, nasty polynomial here. So I don't have to define the discriminant by using this pairwise products of the, or the products of these pairwise differences. But I still want to point out that the two things, the discriminant is an element of F, so it is in our ground field, and number two, it's equal to zero precisely when the roots are repeated. So for those who've taken Galois theory, this is kind of a standard idea in Galois theory, that there should be some number that determines whether or not you have repeated roots. And again, this here is supposed to generalize what happens for quadratic polynomials, right? That's all that the discriminant here says. So what I want to do is give another simple interpretation of this that will help us understand when a quartic curve is singular versus non-singular. So here's our proposition. Say that we have a quartic curve where our f of x here is this long degree four polynomial. 
right? This eight fourths to the fourth plus so on and so forth. So first of all, we can actually compute the discriminant of this degree four polynomial in terms of capital A and capital B. So this capital A and capital B, we've actually seen before, but we're, we're gonna talk about this in a lot more detail today. It just says that if I do a clever substitution, I can express the discriminant in terms of capital A and capital B. Right? So in particular, here's the main thing I want you to take away from this. This quartic polynomial has distinct roots if and only if this delta of E is non-zero. So the whole point here is that this delta of E, we're eventually going to call the discriminant of our quartic curve. So again, the discriminant is going to be non-zero precisely when this f of x, this polynomial, has distinct roots. Right. So now here's actually the second half of the proposition. So we're dealing with our y squared is equal to f of x, our quartic, and we already know that we can embed everything into p3 by using these two quadratic polynomials, f1 and f2. Right. So we're just going to use our quadratic polynomials for our embedding. And now we have this really fancy result. This four by four, sorry, this two by four matrix, this has two rows, four columns, has rank two, if and only if this discriminant does not equal to zero. So again, I've translated the statement of this discriminant, this delta of E, which measures repeated roots in terms of looking at the rank of a certain matrix. So what we're going to do is we'll take these two polynomials, our F1 and our F2. We can now take a look at different partial derivatives. And again, we'll talk about this in more detail in just a minute. And so this states now that this two by two matrix has rank two if and only if the discriminant does not equal to zero. So now we're translating the statements of discriminants into statements of ranks of matrices. All right, so questions or comments so far? Okay. All right, so let's actually try to go through and improve these two statements here. You know, try to figure out what, what's really going on. So first of all, the first statement about the discriminant being that 4a cubed plus 27b squared, that's just a straightforward computation. You can plug it into something like Mathematica or Maple or MATLAB. It's very easy to work out. It's really nothing too interesting there. So let's worry about the second statement. What's happening here with the ranks of matrices? Well, what I want to do first is talk about how this is related to linear algebra. So let's fix a point on our curve, our quartic curve. And remember that we're going to embed everything into P3 because that's where everything seems to be very nice. And I want to consider now this four by two matrix. So what I've done here is I've taken the two by four matrix, right? so this large matrix here, and now I've computed the transpose. Right? So again, I'll take the two by four matrix and we'll compute the transpose. And now this becomes a four by two matrix. And if you start to take a look at the different partial derivatives, to so say this one here just comes down to this polynomial here. Right, so all that we're doing is we're just taking our two polynomials, F1 and F2, we'll just take partial derivatives and then just put everything here into a matrix. Right, so just remember that transpose means that if I have this row here, then that just translates into this column here. Right? Now in linear algebra, there's a couple of different ways we can think of this matrix. One is that this defines a transformation from A2 to A4. So it goes from a two-dimensional vector space to a four-dimensional vector space, right? So that's what I mean by a four by two matrix. Now, there's a couple of theorems from linear algebra that allow us to relate the rank of our two by four matrix to the rank of this matrix. So the first statement is that the rank of this two by four matrix is the same 
as the rank of this four by two matrix because the rank of a matrix is equal to the rank of its transpose. Right, so that's the basic statement from linear algebra. Again, the rank of a matrix is equal to the rank of its transpose. So this is why we really wanna look at this matrix here that I'm calling J sub P. Right, I really just wanna take a look at this four by two matrix. Second, there's a theorem in linear algebra called the rank nullity theorem that says that the rank plus the nullity has to equal to the number of rows. So in this case, the rank plus nullity has to be two. So just to remind you, the rank has something to do with how the columns are linearly independent, and the nullity has something to do with the null space of the matrix. All right, so we'll, we'll talk about this more in just a minute. But again, the rank has something to do with whether the columns are linearly independent and the nullity has to say something about the null space. So putting all of this together from linear algebra, we see the following. This two by four matrix, the one in the theorem, has rank two if and only if the null space of this matrix here, this JP, is trivial. Right, so the null space being trivial means that the nullity is zero. If the nullity is zero, then the rank of the matrix is two, but we just said that the rank of the matrix is equal to the rank of its transpose. So again, if we really wanna prove that we have something of rank two, we have to show that this matrix, this four by two matrix, has trivial null space. All right, so any questions so far? Is that this kind of makes sense? Right, so we're just translating everything into linear algebra. So now let's just do some linear algebra for a few minutes. Well, I need to do an if and only if. So I want to say something about that this matrix has rank two if and only if the discriminant is non-zero. So let's first say that the matrix does not have rank two. So I need to prove that the discriminant is equal to zero. Right, so again, if we assume that this two by four matrix does not have rank two, I'm gonna to have to prove that the discriminant equals zero. So that means not having rank two means that I have something in the null space. So I can find some vector, call this here C1, C2, where if I multiply it on the right, then I get back this zero vector. Right, so again, I'm assuming that the matrix does not have rank two, so then there has to be something in the null space. But then what that really means, if I multiply everything out, so this is just by taking derivatives and multiplying everything out, now I have a statement here that involves a product of four by four matrices and then this vector corresponding to x1, x2, x3, x4. Right, so the x's here, remember they correspond to that point P that was on the coordinate curve. So, I see a couple of things here. I know that the vector C1, C2 is not the zero vector, right, because it's in the null space. And I also know that this vector X1, X2, X3, X0 is not the zero vector because we're dealing with projective space. So that really means that this four by four matrix here, right, so this big long thing, this has to be a singular matrix. Right, again, the, if I have the product of a non-zero vector on the right has to equal to a zero vector on the left, then that four by four matrix must be singular. And if it's singular, then that means that its determinant has to be equal to zero. And now it's just the computation that you actually prove that the determinant is equal to this here. Right, it's, it's kind of a weird computation but the determinant is equal to that once I make this substitution. Right, so just, just the computation that you do. So to recap, if we have something non-trivial in the null space, then I have this element that I'm calling E that has to be the root of this degree three polynomial. All right, so that's the first statement. Now, once I have that E, then I can actually solve for x1, x2, 
in x3, right? Because that was just an equation there, so I can solve for it. And then that means that I have now a point, but because that point must be on the coordinate curve, then I see that this expression here must be zero, which means that this weird looking thing here has to be zero. Right, so this is just making a couple of substitutions and working things out. But I actually have two equations now. So I have this first equation, which came from the determinant of that four by four matrix. I get this second equation that comes from solving for x1, x2, x3, x0, and then realizing that this is just the equation corresponding to f1 equals zero. I remember I had those two quadratic equations. So this is the first one, f1. So now you take these two and you can solve for a and b. Right. So does this kind of make sense, what we're doing so far? Right now we're assuming that there, the rank is not equal to 2, and then you just work through, you kind of solve for C1 and C2, you solve for X1, X2, X3, and then you solve for A and B. So it's just some algebra you have to do. And so then at the end of the day, then you see that this discriminant has to be 0. Because again, you just plug in what you just solve for for A and B. Right, so this is the first direction. So if our matrix does not have rank two, then the discriminant is equal to zero. Okay. So now let's go in the opposite direction. So let's assume that the discriminant equals to zero. So I have to prove that the rank does not equal to two. So this is actually a little bit easier because we've already done all the formulas, so now I just work backwards. So let's choose E to be this. Right, it's just going to be my choice. And once I do that, then I can solve for the x's. Right, so here's just going to be my definition for the x's. And then I can solve for c1 and c2. So if you will, here are just some definitions. So once I tell you what E is, I've defined for you x1, x2, x3. I've defined c1 and c2. So then I'm doing all of this so that I see what A and B have to be, right? Again, I'm just working backwards from the formulas from before. So then I see that F1 has to be zero and F2 has to be zero because they come back to this weird thing that we talked about earlier. So again, with my choices that we're making here of E, and C and so on and so forth, we get the F1 and F2 have to be zero. So that means I actually do have a point on the curve. Moreover, you can check that the C1, C2 is in the null space, because again, we're just working backwards. And so then we can conclude that if the discriminant is equal to zero, then our matrix does not have rank two. Because again, I've just explicitly given you something that's in the null space. Okay, so any questions here on this, this result? All right. So now we have this idea of the discriminant, it being non-zero, saying something about the rank, but this capital A, capital B looks a little bit strange and it kind of suggests that there should be an elliptic curve in the picture. So I wanna kind of remind you as some motivation before we go there, let's go back to our familiar coordinate curve. All right, so this y squared is equal to one minus x squared, one minus k squared, x squared. So we found that if we make this substitution here in terms of capital X, capital Y, then we really do have a cubic curve. All right, so we found this weeks and weeks ago and so what I'd like to know is, can we do this in complete generality? So instead of doing this very specific coordinate curve, can we write this in a very general sense? All right, so luckily the answer is yes. So let's go back to our arbitrary coordinate curve. So our f of x here will be anything that we want, right? So any degree four polynomial. 
And we're gonna to need to make a couple of assumptions. So first, let's say that we do have at least one point on the curve. All right, so let's write it this way. So at least one point. And number two, let's assume that our discriminant does not equal to zero. So then the statement is that E, our quartic curve, really can be expressed as a cubic curve where it's the same A and B as before, right? The same exact A and B as before. And moreover, I can choose the substitution to have coefficients over F. So simply put, our quartic curve really is an elliptic curve, right? So it's always an elliptic curve, but it's in disguise. So really what I'd like to do is go over the proof of this, and then I wanna go over some examples to say, it's not so much the proof, this is more an algorithm to explain how to do this. So if someone were to give you a quartic curve, I'm gonna explain how you can actually find the right substitution to do this here, right? To place it here as a cubic curve. So to do this, we're actually gonna break this up into two cases depending upon what's happening with our point P. So remember that XP, YP, those are numbers inside of F. So the first case is, what if YP is equal to zero? Well, remember that we can factor our degree four polynomial in this way. And if YP is equal to zero, then what I actually see is that the X coordinate has to be one of the roots of this degree four polynomial. Right, so that's the very first case, that if yp is equal to zero, then the xp has to be one of the roots. Well, actually, back around the third week or so of the class, we actually did this substitution. So you may remember that when we were discussing elliptic integrals, we actually did something very similar to this. So we said that if you define lowercase x and y in terms of uppercase x and uppercase y, then this is your substitution, All right? So again, this is the exact same substitution that we did when we were discussing elliptic integrals. It's, it's not any more different than this. So this was very specifically the case when the XP is one of the roots of this degree four polynomial. Now, of course, because E4 is our coordinate XP, that is an element of F, so then all of the coefficients I'm dealing with here actually lie over F, right? So what I mean by that is this E4 here is an element of F. So then that means if I take the derivative and plug in a number from F, it's back in F, right? And the same thing has to be true with the second derivative, that that's also an element of F. So all of my coefficients are over F. Everything's defined over the ground field. Moreover, if you stare at the way we've done these substitutions, this point here, if I substitute in lowercase x is xp and lowercase y is yp, that will correspond exactly to this point at infinity. So this really does say that if I have here the first case where my yp is equal to zero, then I have a very nice substitution that corresponds to this cubic curve. Actually, if you remember the way that we did this for the elliptic integrals, then we have the following ratios. So if I take a look at this ratio over here on the left, and now we're gonna substitute in, X and Y are these, in terms of uppercase X, uppercase Y, then we'll find this over here on the right in terms of uppercase X, uppercase Y. All right, so it's just, it's a straightforward substitution it's not a lot of pretty algebra, but it's a matter of just, you just multiply things out and check that it works. So this means that our lowercase x and y is a point on the quartic curve, if and only if uppercase x, uppercase y are on the cubic curve. So this is the very first case. This is almost exactly what we did for elliptic integrals. Right, so, so any questions here on the first case? Why is it that for x, y, 1, you get that it's equal to 0, 1, 0? Well, so this is a matter of you just have to, to do a lot of the substitutions. Um, let's plug in maybe x is xp. And then I want to stare at these equations over here. 
So if I plug in x is xp, remember that xp is equal to e4. So this denominator here has to vanish. So capital X looks like one over zero. For capital Y, it's a little bit trickier because the denominator is zero, but the numerator is YP, and we said that YP is equal to zero. So for capital Y, we're substituting in something like zero over zero. And you have to kind of play around with it a little bit to kind of get things to work. So it's, it's not, not so obvious that this, this is going to work out, but this is kind of one of the things that you would check. Um, maybe a slightly easier way, no, I can't really say it that way, no, that won't make any sense. Okay. Yeah, but th does that, that kind of answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, all right. So this is the first case now. So what happens if YP is equal to zero? jumped ahead to the end. Okay, so now let's do the second case. Well, I'm going to break this up into a couple of stages so that I can explain a very standard trick. So again, the second case is when my yp is equal to zero. So the very first step is I'm going to reduce to the case where my a4 is a perfect square. So what I mean by that is Let's do a Taylor series expansion around XP so that my degree four polynomial for the A's becomes a degree four polynomial in terms of some new coefficient B's. So again, I'm taking my degree four polynomial and let's just do a Taylor series expansion. All right, so I can write this in a slightly different way just by doing a Taylor series. So the coefficients here, b0, b1, they're going to be some new coefficients. And I'll say in just a minute what they are, but just some new coefficients. Now, once I do this, let's divide both sides by x minus xp to the fourth power. So when I do that, I'm going to define two new variables, u and v. That again, just come from dividing that whole equation this f of x by x minus xp to the fourth power. So that if I do that, then here's my new degree four polynomial, right? Here's my new quartic curve. So you just, just take a look at this trick of y squared is equal to f of x, divide everything by x minus xp to the fourth power, and then you'll see this here in terms of lowercase u, lowercase v. And I want to point out that the leading coefficient b4 is a perfect square because it's just yp squared. So again, the very first step is let's just reduce to the case where my leading coefficient is a perfect square. All right. Okay, second step is I'm going to use a very classical trick of an English mathematician named Castles. So he said, let's assume that the leading coefficient is a perfect square. And now here's how we're going to do this. He said, let's write this degree four polynomial as the square of something plus a linear polynomial. All right, so again, I'm going to write my degree four polynomial as the square of something plus a linear polynomial. And here I've just written out all of the explicit coefficients. But again, the whole trick is write it as the square of something plus something linear. So now he says that because I have this v4 is equal to all of this, let's bring that square to one side and let's write it as the difference of squares. So again, I have the difference of squares is equal to a linear polynomial. So now let me make a new definition. I'm gonna define a new variable, call it z. And this is what happens when I factor the left-hand side. So if I factor the left-hand side, then I just do a little bit of algebra, and then I find the following expression here. All right, so the way that you get this is, you factor the left-hand side, this is where you get a factor of z, but then remember that I have something like v plus something, and then v minus something. 
that V minus something, I can also write in terms of Z. And when you just kind of add things together, then you get back this expression here. So I have more details in the lecture notes, but I just want to quickly say that this is what you get. And so I'll take this expression over here on the right, and let's multiply both sides by z squared. So if you multiply that by z squared, then you get back this expression here. So here I just have to do a clever substitution. I'm going to let a new variable, call it w, be z times u. So let me stare at this expression over here on the left. So here you'll see I have a w squared, and then I have a z cubed. So this is almost like an elliptic curve. I mean, it's, it's close. We have to do a little bit more work, but it's almost like an elliptic curve. So now we can just kind of do the work to put it all together. So again, just to recap for step two, if you were to give me, let's say, a u and a v, then we can write this substitution here. Right, so in terms of u and v. And now, I'm going to make a new substitution, z and w. And if I put all of this together, right, so this is just kind of winding backwards doing all the different substitutions, then I'm going to write capital X this way here in terms of lowercase x and lowercase y. And similarly, we'll write uppercase y in terms of lowercase x, lowercase y. So this is just kind of working backwards doing all the substitutions. And if we do all of this, then we find our elliptic curve. Right. So again, the whole point is that we have these two steps. And the last part here, the capital X, capital Y, that's just kind of cleaning things up a little bit so everything looks pretty at the very end. Okay, so I know that we're almost out of time. I just wanted to maybe take a minute or so and give you an example. So do you have any, any questions for me right now? Okay. okay, so let's just try to work out a couple of examples to see what, what is it that we just did. Right, and it's actually not as bad as it looks. So first, let's take a look at this quartic polynomial, this um, quartic curve, y squared is equal to 1 minus x to the fourth. So I realized that there is one rational point. If I plug in x equals 1, I get y equals 0. And I noticed that x equals 1 is a root of this degree 4 polynomial. So let's just do the trick of case 1. So that's it. Let's divide through by x minus 1. And once we do that, then we have this cubic polynomial. So of course, that isn't quite an elliptic curve. It's close, but I have to do a little bit of work. So let's just change around the variables just a little bit. And if I substitute in uppercase x, uppercase y, then now I find this cubic curve. Right. Again, it's just kind of doing a little bit of cosmetic work just to kind of place it in the right form, but it's not too bad. So we're able to conclude that our y squared is equal to 1 minus x to the fourth is equivalent to this elliptic curve here. Right. So any questions on how we did this first example? Okay. All right, let's try to do a second example now. So now let's take a look at this curve. y squared is equal to 1 plus x to the fourth. Well, if I plug in x equals 0, then I get y equals 1. So sorry, this here is a typo. This should be x equals 0. But in this case, the leading coefficient is a perfect square, so we can just do case 2. And that says now, let me observe that I can write my degree 4 polynomial as the square of something plus 1. Right, remember, that was the whole point from before. It has to be the square of something plus some stuff left over. So if I do that, then I can define z and w in this way. So then we find this cubic curve. Well, it's not quite an elliptic curve. We have to kind of do a little bit of cosmetic work to get it to work. And so we do find this elliptic curve here. So we're able to conclude 
that this curve is equivalent to this x cubed minus 4x. Right? Now, let me just quickly say, you probably have noticed in this last example here, I could have probably done the same thing with the previous example, maybe set x equals to 0, y equals to 1. So let me maybe just make a very general remark here to say, what if we're dealing with this chord curve where, of course, k here is a rational number? Well, one rational point here is 1, 0. So we could do the substitution just like on the previous slides. But another rational point is 0, 1. So there actually are two different points I could choose here. Now, if I kind of run through the trick of castles, then I can write our degree 4 polynomial as the square of something plus something left over. But the point is that I have these two different substitutions. So I can, in the first case, make this substitution here, which gives back exactly the expressions that we found earlier, earlier on in the course. They're exactly the same things. Or I can do a completely new substitution. So this new substitution here actually works if I'm dealing with a different point. But at the end of the day, I'm still left with the exact same curve. So sorry, this here is another typo. But again, at the end of the day, I'm left with the exact same elliptic curve. So again, there are two different points I could have chosen, but regardless of which point, I still have the exact same elliptic curve at the end. Okay, so from here on out, I do want to start to say some very general statements about curves, and I do want to start to move into some very general statements that are in algebraic geometry. But I hope that this makes sense to kind of motivate what's going on for cubic curves and quartic curves. So, do so you have any questions for me before we call it a day? So, for general quartic curves, is it also true that if you choose any two uh, f rational points, you will get the same substitution, uh, the same uh, elliptic curve out of it? You, you will get the same elliptic curve. But you won't get the same, um, the same points. I mean, you won't get the same substitution, but you will get the same elliptic curve. So one subtlety here that I probably should hit home a little bit more, if I go back, then the statement is that the coefficients you have, that capital A, capital B, these here are independent of the point P. So that's why I just simply said here, assume that there is some point, but it actually doesn't matter. You could have many points. Oh, okay. Right, but the A and B that you have here at the end, they don't depend upon that point P. Right. Um, it, so, okay. So I guess like if you have an F rational point, it's necessarily true that A sub four is a perfect square, right? No, it is not. Oh, wait, no. Oh. Right, That's, um, and, and, yeah, in general, it, it may not be. So th this is what I was saying, that you have these two different cases to focus on. But in general, no, A4 need not be a perfect square, right? So I mean, just to kind of move forward, this is one of the two examples that we did here. So like in this case, A4 is not a perfect square, but we're able to get the substitution to work. Okay, I think I'm just confused. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, I know that it's late, so so thanks for, for listening. Um, I'll be around for office hours in case you have any questions, and I'll also try to post this video online pretty soon. Okay, okay well, you all have a good rest of the day. Thanks very much, you too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. You. Yeah.